So, when my husband and I decided to try again, we had to have the real discussion of, are we prepared to go through what we went through again? And we made that decision knowing God was in it because God said he wanted this child. And so a storm hit. I bled within the first week of finding out I was pregnant. First ultrasound, we find bleeding in my uterus. The storm was upon me. Now, prophets, a lot of you don't necessarily have the liberty of preparing for your storm. But after today, you will have that liberty because today's message is here to help you identify the storm you are facing today and how to identify the storm that is on its way. You see, storms or weather systems, as the meteorologists call them, are clear. They have very clear signs and circumstances that come together to produce them. Now, if you study these weather patterns and the area you are in, you start to pick up that, oh, it's going to rain today. Oh, it's going to be windy today. It's going to be sunny today. You start picking up the general weather understanding of your area. Now, storms are no different. And I am using the definition of storm in the literal sense here. I'm not necessarily talking spiritual, although we can use this as a very clear allegory. I am talking about the storm you're going to face in your life today because we make this mistake as Christians, as believers in the work of the ministry. That everything is spiritual. When the devil attacks us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the air, right? Except those principalities and powers of the air may show themselves as triggers. They'll show themselves as car trouble, financial problems, health issues, conflicts, overworked, overloaded, exhaustion, stress. This these are some of the symptoms to show that you are facing a storm. Now, before I get into the kinds of storms you're going to face, I want to backtrack a little to Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. And it, since we're talking about storms, you guys should know this scripture pretty well. Now it happened on a certain day that he, being Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a wind storm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and woke him saying, master, master, we are perishing them dramatic prophets y'all we're dying jesus come wake up save us and they were afraid but then he rose and rebuked the wind and the raging water and they ceased and there was calm but he said to them where is your faith so they turned to one another saying who can this be for he commands even the winds and water and they obey him. Now, the term windstorm is an actual real storm type. A windstorm are, wi are winds that can cause light damage to trees, buildings, and may include rain. Wind speeds of a windstorm typically exceed 55 kilometers an hour or 34 miles per hour. They can actually also get a lot stronger than that to the point where they are literally tearing up trees. It's no laughing matter. The windstorm that we see here described in the scriptures. This is the first kind of storm that you will face when you are going through your training process. It's a windstorm. Now, like I said, 34 miles per hour. I mean, if you're driving a car or 55 kilometers an hour for those guys in the metric system, um, 
That's not very fast. I mean, if I'm driving my car down the freeway, I'm getting pulled over by the cops because I'm going too slow. But when you are standing in the middle of a lake surrounded by water and that windstorm comes upon you very suddenly because you're not expecting it, it can be overwhelming. And for a lot of you, this is what you're starting out with. And I want you to recognize that small wind storm you are facing today is one of three levels of storm the enemy is going to use against you. This is going to start with irritations. This is going to start with just oh, strife, maybe strife with your husband. It's going to start with the money's a bit tight. It's going to start with that task that's a little bit important and drawing you away from the instruction that God's telling you to do. God says, do one project a week. Do this lesson this week. And work suddenly comes up and the timeline is just. So you submit that project just late, just a day late, just a little off schedule. That's your windstorm. It seems a little stressing and overwhelming, but somewhat manageable, right? But if you don't deal with that windstorm and rebuke it and bring the calm like Jesus did, then you move up to level two, which is a thunderstorm. Now, thunderstorms, oh my goodness, they are epic in South Africa. Epic. Because they echo and they shatter and they shake the earth. They can be loud and they are crazy and they are fascinating to watch from the safety of my house behind glass windows wrapped up in a blanket held tightly with my husband because they are terrifying. And a thunderstorm is a violent, short-lived weather disturbance. They always use such fancy language. That is almost always associated with lightning, thunder, dense clouds, heavy rain or hail, and strong, gusty winds. This is what happens when you don't deal with that windstorm. Because suddenly, those tight money, that tight money budget becomes financial problems. Because you've got unexpected bills that are popping up that need to be paid. You got debts that you thought you paid off suddenly popping back up saying, hey, remember that credit card that you thought you paid off, but you didn't because a fee came out? Love it when that happens, right? Hey, so I know you just got this thing fixed on your car, but now another thing's wrong that you've got to go spend another hundred dollars on, a couple hundred dollars on to get fixed. Yeah, suddenly that little bit of overworking, that little bit of schedule that put you just off on your projects, now you're a week late on your project submission. Now you're a week overdue on your actual work job and you're coming home more tired. You're coming home more antsy. And that little bit of strife that you were experiencing at home has now started becoming all out marriage conflicts. So yes, we handle it with grace. We handle it with humor. We handle it with anointing and with power. Because now your windstorm, if it's not handled correctly, turns into a thunderstorm. And now it's a bit harder to deal with. Because when it's just irritation, when it's just strife, submitting yourself therefore unto the Lord, resisting the enemy, he will flee. And it's very easy to get up. It's very easy to go to bed, take a little Tylenol, take a little NyQuil, and wake up the next day rested with full health, ready to go again. But when you are at all out war in your own home and at your workplace and just downright exhausted, no matter how much sleep you get, well, now we enter into the grumpy clouds territory. And when you don't deal with your thunderstorm, we move on to our final level, hurricane level. Hurricanes are powerhouse weather events, <clears throat> not just a system, an event that sucks heat from tropical waters to fuel their fury. They form over the ocean, beginning as a tropical wave that moves throughout moisture-rich environments, enhancing any shower and thunderstorm activity in its path. Because thunderstorms turn ocean heat into hurricane fuel. You guys, I need you to understand something. When God puts that pressure on you, when your trainers, your pastors, your leaders, your apostles put that pressure on you to be obedient, to 
submit that project, to handle that warfare and actually stop ignoring what God has told you to do and leave behind those family obligations. Come on, come on, raise of hands, raise of hands here. How many times have you started to step out and be obedient to what God has told you and that family member calls you up for help? Your daughter, your son, your grandmother, your mother, your father, your somebody, Somebody picks up the phone, messages you, says they need help. They're dying. Help me. You're the only one that can help me. And then you get over there to help and realize, actually, no, you weren't the only one that you can help. There is an entire family that could have helped. And I just now left Jesus sitting on the cross all by him lonesome to come over here and bring you out of your sick bed when you weren't even sick. Come on. Don't tell me I'm the only one that's had that's had that happen to me. Y'all know who you are. Unfortunately, when we're at thunderstorm level, when those family obligations call, um, they have disastrous consequences. I had an amazing prophet in office who had such an incident happen and she lost her very life. Hurricanes are no joke. Hurricanes are what take lives. Do you know, you know how we get the names of hurricanes, right? They're named after the very first person it kills. Let that sit for a minute. We joke about Hurricane Ian, Hurricane Susan, and Hurricane this and Hurricane that, except Hurricane Ian was a real person that that storm took because they were not prepared for the sheer force that hurricane was bringing. Now, I'm talking naturalistic storms here, right? Now, especially in those states where hurricanes are very common, you've got storm shelters, right? You've got hurricane bunkers and shelters. You guys have these things in place to handle them. But the problem is you don't have those bunkers in place for your spiritual life. And that's what I'm bringing you guys to today. I've got three steps Three tools for you to handle any one of these storms at any point in your life. And as I've been speaking, I hope you've taken time to look back over your life and consider what circumstantial pressures am I facing? I want you guys to take a moment, pull out your pens, pull out your notebooks. This is teaching week. You should be taking notes. If not, well, you are somebody going to have to go back and re-listen to the recording because we're not doing it for you. Take notes. What circumstantial pressures have you been facing today? Or this past week, maybe this past month, maybe it's been an ongoing. Hurricanes can last for weeks, you know that, right? Just because you experienced one hurricane, one windstorm, one thunderstorm doesn't mean it's over. Because if you don't deal with the windstorm, it's going to turn into a thunderstorm. And then that thunderstorm can then turn into a hurricane. So maybe it started as a windy, a gusty wind that was just pushing the trees a little off center. Where did it start, you guys? What circumstantial pressures have been continuously pulling you away from what God has told you to do, from what your leaders or your trainers have told you to do? Write it down. Take note of them. Maybe I said a few, maybe it sparked you off. Family obligation, financial struggles, car issues, health problems. Maybe you're overworked, you're stressed, you're tired. Come on, list them out for yourself. You know what circumstantial pressures you are facing. And if you really don't know, well, go talk to your trainers and pastors. They'll be able to tell you because they've been looking at your projects. Now, A storm will always form when you're on the path to success. Otherwise, why would the devil need to tank you out? Let me put it this way. If you're not doing any damage to the kingdom of darkness or not causing any harm, he going to leave you alone. So if you're at a point in your training where you are not experiencing any form of storm, you might not be on the path to success. Because this storm will only come when you are a danger to the kingdom of darkness. Okay? The purpose of these storms is to throw you off course, 
attack your faith and cause you to doubt the Lord's instruction to you. That is Satan's very goal is to distract you from what God is having you build. Because if he can distract you from what God is having you build, you stop being a danger to the body of Christ. Now, maybe he's having you build up your character. Maybe he's having you build up your church. Maybe he's having you build up somebody else. Stop and think about that. What has God ha- told you he needs you to build today? More even this week? What is he telling you you need to build up? Because whatever that thing is that God has told you you need to build up will cause damage to the body of Christ. And that's why you're facing that storm. The solution to overcoming your storm. Oh my goodness, you guys. This is super exciting. Three simple things. S O S. S O S, you guys. S O S is how you overcome your storm. It's not save our souls, just so you know. <laughs> No, no, no. Our souls are already saved. We're Christian, right? So we shouldn't need our soul to be saved again. No. It is submission, obedience, and servanthood. These three things make up the SOS that will indeed save your soul. They will overcome that storm no matter what level you are at. And our first S submission. We can only go to 1 Peter 5 verses 5 through 7. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Now, contrary to popular belief, submission does not mean do what you're told. That's obedience. We'll get to that in a minute. Submission is facing your reality. Facing the reality of you kind of need help. Because when you can walk in true submission, you position yourself under cover of the Lord and of your spiritual leader who has commissioned you for the work that you are called to. What this also does is it gives you access to Christ's storehouses and the storehouses of your spiritual leader. So if you look around and your apostle, your pastor, your trainer even, if you don't have one of those, is walking in abundant financial blessing, health, you know, all of those amazing things that you want, submit to them because it gives you access to what they have. When you can have access to what they have, you begin to partake in the financial blessing, health blessing, and peace that is in their own lives. This also is meant to challenge your pride. Submission is not something you just do when it's fair. Submission, like I said, it's not doing what you're told. It's giving all of what you have, submitting all of who you are under the hand of somebody who knows better than you, even if you don't think that's the case. You know, hire a teenager while they, do, while they know everything, right? Let's talk about when you had to learn submission the first time round. You were a teenager, right? You knew everything. What could daddy possibly teach you about managing your finances? What could daddy possibly teach you about computer science, even though he literally built computers for a living? Right? That was me. I was that arrogant little teenager trying to tell my dad that he doesn't know anything about computers, but he literally spent the first part of his life building them from the ground up. Once I learned, and I took my teenager pride, put it on the cross nice and solid, I could actually sit with my father and allow him to teach me what a motherboard looked like and how to build one. It was a lot of fun. To this day, I can look at a computer and kind of understand what certain problems are and help work at fixing them. And I am forever grateful that he, the, God the Father humbled my pride 
Because if I had not done that, I would have missed out on an amazing learning opportunity. And that is what submission is. It's a humbling of your pride, of where you think you know and understand. Because God's going to bring people to help you, but you're not going to like the help that they have to bring. You're not going to like where you say, oh, I need help with my marriage counsel. And they say, well, have you dealt with your pride? I need help with my marriage counsel. My husband is abusing me. Okay, I understand. We're going to get to that. Um, but have you actually spoken to God about what to do? Before we can even get there, have you submitted this situation to God and put him in the middle of it so he can be your defender? But when we're in the middle of those thunderstorms and those windstorms, we don't want to hear that. We want the solution. We want the magic wand. We want that laser beam that we see in movies that'll shoot into the eye of the storm and just make it dissipate, right? Just make it go away. Unfortunately, that has not been invented yet. It don't work. The only way to bring peace to that storm is to put Jesus right in the middle of it. And it's going to happen with the help that you don't want, but you need. So humble yourself, therefore. Submit yourself to one another in love. Because everybody's got a psalm. Everybody's got a song. Everybody's got a hymn. Everybody's got a sermon. They got something to give that you don't have. They see life in a way that you don't see it. And when you can submit under that, you partake in the breakthroughs, in the blessings, in the deliverance, in the healing that they themselves spent their whole life getting. And you get it in five minutes, not 50 years. Once you do this, you gain a sound mind. Healing and spiritual displacement takes place. That is submission. Your second tool is obedience. And for this one, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above the nations of the earth. Ooh, we like that one. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. We want the blessing to overtake us. We want to be set on high above the nations. We want these things, right? Well, obedience is your key to open the door to that storehouse. Remember, submission gives you access, but you still need to open the door. And that's what obedience does. Because when you start walking in obedience, you begin to find favor everywhere you go. You begin to remain healthy. You know, we have a coined phrase here in this ministry. We don't do sick. We just don't. And it's not because we're stubborn and we don't go to the doctor or we ignore our symptoms or push through or we pray it through. No, we just literally don't get sick. Because we're so busy focused in being obedient to the will of God for our lives and the obedience that he has given us that our body doesn't have time to get sick. It's too busy being renewed by the healing oil and power of God every single day because we're building, we're doing a work. God is continually pouring into us because we're walking in obedience. So my body does not have time to get sick and die. That is the power of obedience. Because when you walk in obedience, I assure you, the loaves and the fishes will multiply. That bread that you bought a month ago somehow is still there and it's still good and you're just still eating it. Those vegetables, those onions, those things that you bought to feed your family somehow are still there and you haven't needed to go grocery shopping in a while. And you start thinking, you know, maybe I should. It's been a while. Your finances increase. Suddenly, you've got that little bit of extra cash to buy that sweet for your kid that you didn't, to go to that fun fair, to go to the movies with your friend, with your husband, that little bit of extra money that you needed. And finally, everything you touch will prosper because you walked in obedience. This is the do what you're told point. Remember I said submission is not do what you're told? This is the do what you're told. Do it. There, there is no 
maybe you should, if, cut, no, do it. Just do what you're told part. And our final S is servanthood. Luke 12, verses 42 and 44. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will make him ruler over all he has. A faithful servant receives everything the master has. It is the very door that is open onto you. It is the access to those beautiful storehouses. You know how we say we store up your treasures in heaven? Servanthood get you access to those literal storehouses. This is your ATM. This is you putting in the pin at the ATM saying, withdraw cash, please. <laughs> that is servanthood. This is the withdrawal of cash. When you are submitted, obedient, and serve as the servant. Because get this, guys, minister. The word minister, to be a Christian minister, means to be a Christian servant. Look it up. It means servant, to serve. We are bond slaves, slaves of love to our Christ Jesus. When you committed yourself to the Lord and to the work of the ministry, I'm not talking standard Christians here, guys. You guys are not standard Christians. You're fivefold ministers. You committed to being a minister. You put minister in your name when you go to church. You say, I am minister so-and-so. I'm here to minister to you. Yeah, it means serve. I'm here to serve you not give you my great revelation and my great ideas. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve the temple. I am a priest in the temple and I am here to serve. You know what those priests did in the temple? They cleaned. They cleaned and they cooked and they scrubbed every corner of that temple because God did not delight in a dirty temple. In fact, when there was a dirty temple and they didn't take care, he smite them dead. That's how much he did not like a dirty temple. He didn't mean the people were clean. He meant the temple because that was their point. That is where they lived. That is where they breathed. That is where he lived and breathed. And he did not like coming and seeing that that toilet was stinky and not cleaned. He did not like a stinky toilet, people. Who likes a stinky toilet here? If you like a stinky toilet, you got problems because if Jesus don't like it, well. And servanthood means you pick up the brush and you go into that toilet and you clean it. Because you're serving the other people who come in there. You know, we laugh at this ministry in the prophetic school. We use this example about servanthood, about most prophets are positioned, you know, back in the day behind the screen projector, you know, making sure the songs pop up on the screen and the notes are on the screen. And then also they're toilet scrubbers, right? Because most prophets, I mean, in their churches, they're never fully understood. They're kind of rejected. So the only place they can find to serve is scrubbing toilets. And I've seen firsthand the power of a prophet who walked in that ministry of servanthood. We went to an international church, you know, with one demographic in there. Um, and quite frankly, the service devastated me. Sobbing, I was sobbing because Jesus was never allowed in the service and the people were so hungry and so broken. There were many times Jesus tried, but there were some people there that were so focused on themselves and their showboating that he never got a say and it devastated me. And then we went to the bathroom and there was the one true lonely prophet scrubbing that bathroom with bleach and the anointing. You walked into that bathroom and it was anointed. You fell under the power of God and you received your healing in that bathroom. She was doing deliverance ministry on the beautiful little waiting out area. There were couches that smelled amazing. And there she was praying and laying hands over the women that were coming into that bathroom to receive ministry, speaking healing over them. And you think, and you think, Scrubbing toilets is beneath you, prophet, because you can prophesy, right? 
Oh, I'm so grateful that you went and prophesied on the stage and everybody heard your word. I'm so great for, well, for you going into that deliverance ministry and into the streets. Did the person who needed healing in that bathroom get it? Because they were so broken. They walked out of that service so broken. They needed someone to see their hurt. Are you enough of a servant to get down on your knees and scrub that toilet and be there for them in their time of need? That is servanthood. Servanthood is mastering the way every member in your church likes their coffee. You know, I love, I love Denise Jordan so much. Prophet Denise Jordan, you guys. Because when she went to her local church there in South Africa, looking for a place to serve, one of the few places that opened up was the coffee bar. Now she, she all, she has a rep, you guys. She loves her coffee. You know what she loves the most about her coffee? It's making sure you love your coffee. I can sure as bet you. She knows almost every single person's order yet. She knows what sugar they like. She knows what syrup they like. She knows how warm they like it. And if she hasn't yet, it's because she hasn't worked through everybody just yet. She's working on it. She's got that mental list because she's such a servant. It means knowing people's coffee orders. It means knowing and making sure that other people are ready for their job interview. It means making sure that everybody who is looking for a place to serve gets that place to serve, gets that place to step out, that that budding prophet gets the chance to step out and give their first prophetic word in a safe environment over you that you have gone out of your way to prepare them and the environment for them to step out. That is servanthood. Because when you serve, you build the kingdom of Christ. You do your job. This is the job requirement of every minister, every team member here in this ministry, every lecturer, every pastor, has done this and does do this every day. Now, I'm going to show you how practically to use each one of these tools to bring your storm to peace. But as we do, I want you to really recognize and sit meditating on the power of these three simple words of submit, obey, and serve. It is your S-O-S. Because already as I've been speaking, you start looking at your circumstances, you start lining these two up, you're going to be able to go check. You know, if I had just taken five minutes to serve that person coffee, I would not have gotten the lashback I got. You know, if I had taken two seconds to just be obedient and do what my leader told me to do, I wouldn't be overworked and overdue on this task here. You know, if, if I had just humbled myself and let that person show me how to do a job I thought I already knew how to do, I would not be struggling and stressed out because I don't know how to do this job. You will start recognizing all those little circumstances and how you could have already started applying these three points to those problems to bring peace. But practically speaking, for submission... Ask for help. Remember, this is the humbling phase. So even after you've already said no to the person, oh yes, we're going to embarrass you further. So you just made this big stink of yourself, right? I already know how to do this. I'm really okay. I don't need your help. Please, please go focus on what you need to focus on, right? Preferably, I hope you said that with a lot better tone. But I know us prophets are prophetic types. We don't necessarily always have a nice tone when our pride is being uh, brought up. And so uh, you got to humble yourself and go back to that person and say, so you know how I boldly told you I don't need your help? Well, I was wrong. I need your help. Can you show me how to do this? And then you very nicely shut your mouth and you listen and you learn and you allow them to teach you even if you think you already know. Bind that spirit of irritation that bu bubbles up in you as they go over something and you feel like they're making you stupid. Okay, find it. You asked for the help. Humble yourself. Submit yourself to one another. 
and then accept the help that you are given. Even if it's the same thing you already know, accept the help. Because sometimes it's not even about that you learn something new. It's just the fact that you submit enough to listen to someone else's perspective that brings the peace and the revelation you need to get the answer to the problem. Take responsibility for the mistakes of others and take the lower speed seat, especially if you're falsely accused. Now, in a team dynamic, this happens quite often because we work on a lot of joint projects. And you will often hear our apostle say, so and so, why didn't you do this job? Why didn't you do this job? You, I told you to do this job. And you know, very rarely do I hear our team go, um, that was so-and-so's job. They were working on that. I had nothing to do with it. Because I know my team. Our team, we collab. Even if it was someone else's job, even if it was Dalton's job, you can sure bet he came to me and we were talking about it and we were collabing back and forth. He took some of what I had to go do that job and he ended up not succeeding. So you know what? I'm going to take responsibility. I'm not going to cast the blame on him to get out of trouble. Whew, I didn't make the mistake. I did my job perfectly. Well, I collabed and he did something wrong. So obviously I did something wrong too. Submit. Humble yourself. Take the lower seat, please. Because when I can accept a mistake, I can learn from it. Prophets, pastors. Pastors, I feel I got this better than prophets, so. Accept the mistake. I don't care if you did it or didn't do it. Accept it. Take responsibility for it because you can learn from it. You know, the biggest pressure I ever put on Dalton when he was going through training is everything is your fault. If the camera went down, if the internet went down, if the weather was bad, if the, some student manifested, it's Dalton's fault every time I would shout it out in a public meet. Guys, I did this in public meetings too. We would be at workshop conferences. He was the new guy. He was my trainee. I'd say, it's Dalton's fault, y'all. You know what this guy did? After a few headbutting moments, he said, it's my fault, guys, before I even had a chance to say anything. He said, sorry, that's my fault. I didn't pray enough. I didn't serve enough. He would take responsibility. You know what? Guys, the moment he did, things came right. It just needs a prophet to be put in place to take on the weight of the church and everything comes in line. Hallelujah. Prophets, take on the weight of the church. Take on the responsibility. It's what you're called to do. And when you do it, things come right. Submit. Humble yourself. The state of the church is your fault. I don't care what the pastor did wrong. I don't care that he's teaching false doctrine. It's your fault. Because you're the prophet. And you're called to build and establish the kingdom of God. So take responsibility, please. Submit. Submit to the unfair pressure. I don't care that the pastor doesn't believe in the five-fold ministry and the prophetic ministry or anything else. I don't care. That's not your job. Your job is to take on the weight of the church, to take on responsibility that they don't know who Jesus is. It doesn't matter if you're a prophet or not. I'm sorry, do, does my son need to be a prophet to be my son? Does my son need to have some sort of five-fold title in order to just be who he is? No, he's my son. No matter what, I birthed him from this womb. He could be the biggest jerk in the world and I will still love him. He will still be my son. Doesn't matter his status. And prophet, it's the same for you. It doesn't matter your title, you're still a prophet. Can you do the job? Can you submit? Run to correction with open arms. It's your best friend. This kind of goes along with that. First part, run to it, look for it, seek it out. If you feel like you've done something wrong, go to your leader. Go to the person who gave you that instruction. And well, confess your sin. Confess your wrongdoing so that you may find peace and resolution. You may learn. Finally, communicate with others as they communicate. This last one is a little more difficult. How many of you have had misunderstandings with your trainers or your pastors? Because they 
use different terminology with you. Or you use a different terminology with them from your old past church culture. Hmm? Come on. Almost every single one of my students and I have butted heads on this. Mm -hmm. I see a few hands slightly raised like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. It happens. So submit. Submit to the new culture that God has placed you in. And learn how they speak. Learn how they communicate and communicate as them. If you are not using their lingo, if you are not praying the way they pray, if you are not speaking the way they speak, then you have yet to submit to the culture that God has placed you in because he needs you to gain a character. Remember, this is all about the storm. How silly would it be for me to come from California and Mexico where, where earthquakes are more common to go to one of the states that are more common with hurricanes and not learn how to prep for a hurricane. They kind of get them every year. They know. How silly is it for me to sit there and argue and say, that's not how you prepare for a natural disaster. I don't need to go into a bunker. You go there, you go do this. They're going to look at me and say, you stupid. You're going to get taken out. That hurricane going to be named after you. You don't listen. <laughs> Can we be real here? <laughs> I, I'm just being real. Come on. I have to learn how to adapt to that country or that state's way of living if I want to survive there. Okay? So if I have to do that in the natural to avoid a hurricane, why can't we do it in the spiritual to avoid a spiritual hurricane that's going to take us out? Guys, come on. God didn't put you in this environment by mistake. He didn't put you in this environment so you could pick up a full, few cool principles. Hello, this is module two. And our scholars, you guys are here because God needs you to establish a kingdom. And that kingdom better have his culture. And he needs you to take this culture and make it part of your culture to build his kingdom. So if you're not speaking the way that God's telling you to speak, you're not living the way that God's told you to live, well, then expect a few hurricanes. Obedience. This one is very simple. I want to give you a slight little project to warm you up because let's be honest, some of us have, I love what our apostle says. Some of us have only a daily obedience. Some of us have a weekly obedience, a monthly and a yearly obedience rate. Now, what this means is maybe you're okay with being obedient day to day. Your, day, your daily obedience, you can meet your daily obedience quota, right? But some of us are better at doing those daily and meeting the weekly obedience where God says, do this for the week. Then there's the obedience where God says, do this for the month. Then he says, for the year, for the next two years. But not of any of us have worked up to that. And so we're going to build your obedience muscles. You're going to start by daily obedience, submitting your day to the Lord, submitting each struggle that you've been facing, especially from the day before to the Lord, and asking him for instruction. Then you're going to take note of that instruction. Write it down. Put it as your home screen. Put it on the sticky note on your laptop, whatever it is. And you're going to look and stare down at that obedience. You're going to make a point of doing that obedience for the day, that day. Not right before you go to bed, although if you can at least get it before you go to bed, hey, cool. Prefer give yourself a little more time. Because God's instruction is quite clear. Do not end your day. Do not go to sleep at night. I don't care if you got to stay up until 2, 3 in the morning. Do not go to bed at night until you have done the obedience for the day that God has given you. Okay? And you're just going to do that every day. Once you've done that for a few days, start seeking the Lord for your week. Write down that sticky note. Write it on your phone, whatever it is that you need to remind yourself daily to complete that task. Do not go to sleep on the last day of your week without having completed that obedience. And repeat this process until you've reached that monthly and yearly goal. Okay? Super easy. Build up your obedience habit, you guys. 
build it up. And also, last but not least, obey the protocols <laughs> of your leader, of your apostle, and of your school or workplace. Obey the protocols. Because sometimes it's easy to pick and choose what obediences we want, right? There are some obediences that are easy for us in our schedule because we've had a lifetime of experience in those protocols or obediences, and so we do them, right? We have our all worship every Sunday, um, daily prayer about this certain problem, whatever the case is, you're good at that. But now God says, submit one to two projects a week. Now God says, um, I want you writing a weekly update to your trainer or to your pastor. Now your leader comes and says, I want you to minister this way instead. I want you to do step one, step two, step three. This is how we counsel. This is how we minister. Obey them to the letter. This is not submission. This is obedience. Just do it. Do it. Do the job. There is no ifs, ands, and buts. There are no excuses. I am not taking excuses today. Neither is God and your leader. No excuses. Just do it. If you got to stay up until four in the morning, do it. Got it? All right. Servanthood. Your job as a prophet is to build the kingdom of God. And I say prophet, but especially for all of us as ministers, our job is to build up the kingdom of God, to build and establish the city on a hill. This is our goal. I wake up in the morning saying, let's get to work. What else on that city on a hill needs to be built today? We need a watchtower. We need walls. We need window panes. What needs to be built today? That is our goal every morning when we wake up as ministers of the gospel. So, if you want to be a good servant, you're going to take time to invest. You're going to invest your time. You're going to invest your money. You're going to invest your love. You're going to invest your head space, your lifestyle to your leaders, to your peers, to your trainers. Because it's easy for us to do that investment in our relationship with Jesus, right? I can invest into Jesus very well, but Jesus gave us these relationships for a reason. So when we serve one another, when I serve my leader, when I serve my sister, when I serve my son, I am serving God. That's how I see it. That's how you should see it. When I make sure my son has lunch or breakfast for our day at the office, I'm not just throwing leftovers together. I'm throwing gourmet leftovers together. I am making sure those leftovers may as well have been from a restaurant. I am making sure, and he's three years old, you guys. He'll be happy with chicken nuggets. But I, as the mother, am not satisfied with that. I am not satisfied with my child just having whatever I threw out of the freezer. Because I'm here to serve. And if I can't even serve my own son a decent meal, how am I going to serve the body of Christ the meat that they need to survive? This is servanthood. I serve my family. My, my husband, oh my Lord, the amount of fights we've gotten into on date night because I ask him what he wants. He's, oh, I'm fine with just eggs. Date night dinner and he wants scrambled eggs on bread. And I will turn to him and I will say, are you doing this because you don't want me to cook too much or, or work too hard because you know I'm tired? He goes, yes. I said, uh-uh, we're not doing scrambled eggs. It's date night. We're going to do steak. We're going to mashed potatoes and gravy. We're going to do a dessert. We are going to do a proper date night meal. And I'm going to deck out that bedroom on top of that. I don't care how tired I am. I don't care how much of a long day I had. I don't care how much warfare I'm facing. You know what? You need some investment. And I'm going to invest into you because that's what date night's all about. And so I get up off my high knee and I go and do that. And I make a plan. And I invest into my husband. Now, if I can do that with my spouse, can I not do that with the kingdom of God? Where are you investing your finances? Where are you investing your time? Where are you investing your work ethic into your peers, into your leader, into your trainers and your lecturers, guys? Because that is servanthood. So yeah, do your lessons. Learn the routine of your leader. How many of you have taken time to learn the routine of your boss in your workplace so that you can make sure they have their coffee on time? To make sure that they've got lunch sorted. 
How many of you have made an effort of just poking your head in saying, hey, boss, just wanted to let you know, uh, it's lunchtime. Did you want me to bring anything to you? Are you sorted? Are you okay? Hey, boss, um, just checking in. Did you need me to do anything for you? Just do it without somebody nagging at you and su suggesting it to you. That's what children do. Children need reminding. We're adults. And maybe you might need some reminding in the beginning because we're all children in the faith, right? But you should be able to put away childish things at this point. Start learning to serve. Start small. Master the coffee making. Scrub the toilets. Make sure the house is clean and smells good. Make sure the laundry is put away. This goes for all of you. I'm, I'm listing like very home, normal things that a lot of you moms do on a daily basis. But this goes for husbands as well. You know, if you come home before your wife and you see that laundry isn't put away, you know your wife's meaning to get to it, go put away the laundry. Do you know how many times my husband has done that for me, especially since being pregnant? I come home, I'm exhausted, I'm falling asleep on the couch, and I wake up and the laundry's put away. Ministers to my very soul, you guys. I've never experienced such a ministry in my life. And it sounds so silly. But you know, when you can take those little weights off of people's plates, it enables them to actually hear from Jesus. It enables them to be put in a position to receive healing. Because I don't know about you, but as a mom, when I am so busy focused on all the stuff that I need to do, I rarely take time to recognize that I'm bleeding, that I've got a broken leg that needs healing. It's only when my husband can sit me down or Jesus Mostly Jesus, my, my poor husband, I'm too stubborn sometimes, has to legit sit me down like poor old uh, Ezekiel, put, tie me to a chair, throw me places to say you need help. So when you can serve and take that weight off their plate, they can receive healing. This is the power of servanthood. So at this point, you should have some options here. First of all, what storm are you facing today? Are we starting at windstorm level? Are we at thunderstorm level? Are we, are we on the verge of becoming a thunderstorm? Or are we at hurricane level and you've just been taken out? You've been waylaid. Like you haven't submitted projects in weeks because you keep getting stuck on that lesson. This problem, the car still hasn't started. It's been, it's been another two weeks since the car got started properly. I don't know. Where are we? What's your level? Drop in the chat box, take a note of it, whatever the case may be. What are the circumstances that you are facing in those storm levels? Take note of them. Finally, using SOS. What can you do starting today after this class connect? To submit, obey, and serve. That is your project for this week. And we're not going to go into breakout rooms because this is a project you're going to need to work with your trainers and your pastors on. Okay? And I really encourage you guys to work on it. Do some study by yourself first, by all means. You should have some study points ready to discuss with your trainers and lecturers but work with them because they have been marking your projects. They have been ministering. They've been watching your cap, um, your cap comments. They know what you go going through. Trust me. Okay. Even if you don't, they do. They've done this a few times. They will be able to help you navigate those circumstances more effectively, especially if you've been facing this wind your entire life and it's been, this is your lifestyle and you don't know what peace looks like or sounds like you're going to need some extra help. Okay. So I thank you, Lord, for all these amazing ministers and servants that you have pulled together. All these storm busters and storm chasers. I thank you, Father, for the strength that you've given each one to stand and face their storms. But I also thank you, Father, that they don't need to face it anymore. But the Lord wants you guys to know I've not called you to live with this storm. I've called you to command it. For if you can say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, then this storm should be no problem. For indeed, the enemy has come and he has attacked your faith. 
He has attacked your faith and he has made it difficult for you to be obedient to me. But I recognize that I have prepared a way for you where the enemy tried to cover over with those storm clouds. I have indeed made a way for you. It is a way that I made many years ago in preparation for this very moment. For there is nothing new under the sun for me. I know what you will face. I know what you have faced. So prepare yourself. Arm yourself. Because the storms will keep coming while you are a danger to the kingdom of darkness. Because that is exactly the mandate that you took on when you said yes to me that day. So I impart to you this day, says the Lord, the weapons of warfare that are mighty indeed. For the tearing down of strongholds, I impart into you this very day the SOS that will give you the victory over the storms that you face and the storms that others face. Receive this day the victory that I promised you so long ago, says the Lord.